Hey, good morning. Hey, if you're new, I am. I'm Charlie Lofton. I'm the, the lead pastor here at the Grove Church. I mean, we are really glad that you are here worshiping with us today. You've um, caught us. We're in the middle of a series about Moses and kind of the purpose that God had for his life and kind of how God wants to, uh, he has a purpose in mind for each one of us. Before we get into that, there's a picture I'd like to show you real quick. This is a picture of me and my wife uh, during halftime of Friday night's basketball game. Um, they honored all the season ticket holders that used their um, tickets every game last year. And so somehow, I'm not sure I managed to make my way to the front of the line. Which, so, and, and so we came in this way and we went out the opposite way. And so somehow I was able to be on the court more than anyone. Um, this doesn't have anything to do with anything that we're talking about today. So let's just go ahead and move that slide on up. All right, perfect. Sometimes you show a picture and you tie it in, and sometimes you just think, I control the stage. I'm just going to show that picture. (laughs) So we've been talking about purpose, right? And last week, Mark got up here and he kind of said, man, if you feel like that God's kind of put a purpose on your on on your heart you know you can text it you know to uh, to us we'll kind of look at these just kind of you just want to know some things that are going on and i heard mark say that and i was like man i know who gets those texts and so i just thought about you know sending funny jokey insults to that person and like well, that's not cool no one wants that and um, then i thought man well how what if i what if i really wanted to answer that how would i how would I do it? And I was like, it was, you know, it just kind of felt hard for a text. And, and then some things happened um, since then. And it happened to me twice in the last week. And if it's happened to me twice this last week, it's probably happened to me at least a hundred times over the course of my seven years here at the Grove, where you hear some version of this story and you hear someone who's never really gone to church before or someone who used to go to church but has felt disconnected and shunned in some way and has not gone to church for years, you know, feel like they're giving God their last shot and, or, or their first shot and just have never really enjoyed church, never really connected with God in any in a way or it's been a while. And you hear them say, and it's some, you know, some backstory like that and it's like, and, and we came to the grove and maybe for the first time in my life, I really, I really just felt at home. I, f- I felt peace. I felt joy. I feel like I, f- I experienced the presence of God for the, for the first time really in my life. And I, and I got to hear that a couple of different times this week. And it, and, and it was that it just kind of clicked for me. If I, if I could put that in a text, if I could put that in a text, that's what I would have texted um, in, in, in the thing last week that, the purpose. You know, I just, I just get excited about those people. The people who come and for whatever reason, they come here uh, hopeless and, and believing that they, at least at this point in their life, have never really been able to find hope in life in, in God's church. And so we've got, we kind of, our, our mission statement really reflects that. It's on the wall when you walk in that God's called us to reach people. Reach people to become fully devoted, world-changing followers of Christ. That it's not just, we're not just trying to figure out how we can do the best for you who are already here. But we want to have a heart for the people who are, who are not here. Who are brand new to here. And um, my guess is, is that for a lot of you, you have a story that's a little bit connects with that. Maybe at least on some level, you can remember when you, when you first came here... And, and there was just something that happened. There was something about the worship. There was something about the people that just really felt like, man, that God was speaking to you in kind of a, a new and fresh way. And you remember that and that awesome thing that God did. And, and, and in that stage, in that stage of kind of your, 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 your time here at the Grove, you know, we, we call that the, you're the mission. You're the mission. You're the reason why we, we, we painted the mission statement on the wall. So that, so that you could experience that thing. But then God does that work in you. He kind of heals you. He draws you. And then we kind of need you to come to another phase where you're like, man, that was really an awesome season for my life. I wonder if God could use me to help the church do that for the next people. I don't want to just be one who receives it, but I've received it now. And, and I want to see God do this more in more people's life. And so you think, man, how can I help? Can I help be on the greeting team, help with making coffee or with the kids or with the youth group or with the worship or on the prayer team? There's lots of ways to help. And you think, man, I want to help us do this thing that God's called us to. And that's great. 
But a lot of times for people, that's kind of where, where you stop. But we don't want that to be where anyone, where anyone stops. Because we think there's another level out there. Where you're not just receiving the mission. You're not just helping us. But God gives you a purpose. And you really define this thing in you. Where you're like, God, is, God has called me and He has designed me specifically for this kind of ministry, this kind of impact in the world. And we did get some responses back, and I've talked to some people outside that didn't text in, and it was interesting to me how many of the responses kind of resolve, revolved around uh, uh, loving and serving people who, who feel voiceless. You know, there was um, some people who talked about um, crisis pregnancies. These moms that just feel like they don't have anybody and they don't know what to do and they have these awesome unborn babies and, and, and how to bring love and hope to them. People talking about racism and how we, we live in a place where minorities feel oppressed and there's a system that just, it just, it just doesn't work for them. And, and they need someone to love them and advocate for them and try to bring about justice for them. And then there's a group of people who also, who have been kind of helping out with this group called Canopy, which is uh, kind of a ministry for, for refugees that get, that get located here in northwest Arkansas. And I mentioned those three things, and they're an interesting three things to put together. Kind of uh, racial injustice and, 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 and uh, unborn babies and, and refugees. Because he's like, man, those things are pretty political. And I would like to suggest to you that I don't care that they're political. And they're not political to me. And they're not political to us. Because what God has said from the very beginning is that God has called His people to be a voice for people who do not have a voice. And the politicians can do whatever politicians do. And sometimes we'll like what they do and sometimes we won't like what they do. But we know what God has called us to do. Which is to love and be a voice for them. And so the refugee thing has kind of gotten a lot of press over the last year. And it doesn't really matter. Uh, in, in that regard, that God has called us, man. If God is going to put foreigners and strangers in our land, this was his call on his people all the way in the time of the Exodus, the, this thing that we're talking about. And when there, when there are foreigners and strangers in your land, you give them extra love and you give them extra care. And, and that's what this group has done. And I was talking to Scott Sutton, one of our elders, about it. He's been on this team. And I was like, man, tell me who all is on the team. And I want to kind of honor everybody who's been kind of working specifically. And he gave me a list of like eight names. And here's the problem. When somebody gives you a list of eight names, there might be nine, right? If there's only two, you know there's two. But if there's eight, they could be nine. And I list off eight and you're number nine. Now we're all in trouble. So kudos to all of you. <laughs> At least eight of you, right? Okay? And, and it's just a really cool deal to just kind of say, man, we want as God's people to say, welcome. And we want to show people the love of Christ in a real, in a real tangible way. And so it's just really cool to find people, to be able to find these kinds of ministry, to bring racial healing, to bring national healing, to bring healing to people in, in all of these situations. It's just really cool. And we believe that God's going to help you find a purpose. And I'll kind of tie this all back into Moses. It was kind of clear from the beginning of Moses' life what his purpose was. God was going to uh, bring his Israelites. They'd been in slavery in Egypt for years. And he was going to, he was going to br- deliver them. But he always, I mean, just 99.9% of the time, when God wants to do something, he's going to do it through people. And so he raises up Moses specifically, and through these really cool circumstances, places an Israelite to be raised as the grandson of the king of Egypt. So someone who has access to leadership but also would have the heart to free his own people. And God is orchestrating all of this from the very beginning, which is really cool, and we believe that God's done that for you. He's orchestrating the circumstances of your life to make a difference, for purpose. And But Moses, I mean, he, he, he fell. He kind of began to realize this, this thing that he needed to do, and he did something terrible. He killed someone. And believing that that essentially disqualified him from everything, he's in exile now uh, in the wilderness. But here's the thing that we learned uh, the, the next week is that God will redeem anyone. And so you may feel like that God may at one point have had a purpose for you, but you've done something or you are something, you're doing something that's disqualified you. And I'm, I'm uh, just almost 100% positive that it's not murder. And if God will redeem the murderer, God will redeem you. And he still has that purpose. And so he calls Moses back. 
And Mark showed this last week. He's on his way back and, um, to, to do this thing and to, and to talk to Pharaoh. But it doesn't go the way that you think it would. You think, well, you, you obey and then it, it works out great. In fact, it says that God was hardening Pharaoh's heart. But when Moses showed up and did the thing, one thing that we saw through these plagues that kept coming to Egypt, when you show up for God, His power comes with you. And so through all of these miracles He's doing and these plagues, He is, he is establishing Himself as God. He is changing the hearts of the people. And finally the Pharaoh relents and lets the people go. And it's an awesome thing. And here's what you would expect. Here's what you'd expect in this kind of a story. And everything worked out great. Amen. Right? You know, I was like, okay, this, this worked. You know, was, Moses had his down, and he brought him back up, and he went and go, did the thing. And now they're free. Let's show the credits at the end of the movie. Right? And this is how I want all my movies to end. All of them. All of them. Where all the bad guys are, are, have been vanquished, and, and the good guys live happily ever after. Right? Those, those are the movies I want to go to. I don't want to go to the movies that have the tragic end. That's so, it's there to make you think. You know the artsy movies? Right? The ones that win awards that no one goes to, right? Which is ridiculous. Just, we're not talking about anything important now, but can I just say this? Just think about this for a second. Just think about this for a you can write this down. Can a movie be good if no one wants to see it? <laughs> write it down. Write it down. And think about it. You give me an answer to that question, you can email me this week. Well, what were we talking about? Oh, happy ending. But that's, but that's not what happens. That's not what happens. This, 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 the story is actually far from over. So we're going to find ourselves here in Exodus um, chapter 13, starting in verse 17. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though that was shorter. For God said if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led the people around by the desert road toward the the Red Sea. The Israelites went up out of Egypt ready for battle. Moses took the bones of Joseph with him because Joseph had made the Israelites swear an oath. He had said, God will surely come to your aid, and then you must carry my bones up with you from this place. After leaving Succoth, they camped in Etham at the edge of the desert. By day the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light so that they could travel by day or night, all right? Because I'm old school, about old, I guess I just mean old, and and I went to church a lot, I hear these stories and I just always imagine the flannel graph. Has anybody ever been in like a kid's class with, and you even know what I'm talking about, flannel graph, right? There's these little flannel boards and you could just kind of stick the characters up there and I just think about the, here's the, there's the cloud and there's the fire and there's Moses and, you know, one sticker that has like eight people on it with sheep going this way. And you're like, anyways, I just imagine. So we, we, we're clear here that God is leading them with this cloud and this fire. He's leading them. He's taking them where he wants to take them. And it says, you know, I could take you this way through the Philistine country. It would be shorter, but there would be war there. And I don't think you're ready. And that sounds real nice. That sounds real kind. But let's just kind of look at this map here just a little bit real quick. This kind of little map study here. So they're here in Egypt, which of course all of, most, most all of this is desert. So if you're trying to get from here to, to over here, which is the promised land, and you're in the desert, you have to travel next to water because that's where you can drink water and, there's, and that's where there's vegetation and these kinds of things. And so like, it would be easier for me to take you here through the Philistines. It would be shorter, but I don't think that you're ready for war, so we'll go this way. And so Moses understands this because this is where he was hanging out. And when he came to Egypt, he came this way. But look at the way that they go. They go this way, straight to the sea. You could go this way. Do you understand? I'm sure we're really clear here. You could go this way around the sea and then get down here. But he takes them not that way, but that way, straight to where they're going to come and run straight into a sea. Now... It's real nice to avoid the war, but why would you, if you're trying to lead your people to this land, why would you take them to a sea that you cannot cross? That just seems mean. It seems inefficient. And we'll just say it this way. God leads his people directly into obstacles. 
This was on purpose. It wasn't accidental. It isn't that Moses didn't know the way. Moses knew the way. He had traveled the right way already. He knew the right way to go. Um, But God is leading them. And he leads them to a place where they will not be able to cross. And even worse than that, he knows what's about to happen. Because in fact, we're going to look at that passage here in just a little bit. He knows what's about to happen. He's going to stir Pharaoh up. And tell, make a Pharaoh regret what he did. And he's going to send an army after them. So God is leading them purposefully to a place where there is a sea that they can't cross in front of them. And an army ready to kill them behind them. And God did this on purpose. My guess is, is if we will allow it to, if we will allow ourselves to just kind of process that, that we're going to learn something new about God today. Because that just doesn't seem like the kind of thing that God would do for His people. That He went to all this trouble, really, to kind of rescue them and to send them to this promised land. Why would you not, why would you do this? Why would you directly put them in a place where bad things are going to happen? And I'm going to be honest with you, this is one of the hardest truths in all of the Scripture for us to understand. Because I just think there's something about the American mind and the American way of looking at God and the way that looking our lives that we just cannot understand this. And we have all of these reasons. If something bad happens to a Christian, we have all these reasons why it happens. And I'm not saying these reasons are wrong. They're actually right. Maybe it is, it is Satan and demonic forces that are working against us in some way. I'm trying to do this great thing for God and I feel like there's opposition. Yeah, okay, that happens. Man, we just live in a fallen, broken world where bad things happen. Also true. Both of those things are true. But we need to understand that sometimes it is also 100% true that He leads you there. I'm trying to do this great thing for God. And He has intentionally led me to a place where I will not be able to do it. There's something about that that just doesn't... That doesn't it, it, just, it just doesn't sound right. This is not how we see it. We, just, we have this mentality, I think. The mentality is that if I'm going to do this thing for God, I think part of it is, well, if I'm going to do this thing for God, I'm doing God a favor. And if I'm going to do God a favor by doing this thing for God, then what He's going to do in in gratitude for me doing this thing for Him, that He's going to do everything He can to make everything pleasant. Right? That's what we think. But it would just seem, it would just seem that that just doesn't seem to be what he, he's, no, that's actually not what I'm doing. And he's going to intentionally lead them to a place they will not be able to escape from. And so, if it's true that this is really kind of new information for us, and this just says, this tells us something about God that we don't know, it would be very natural for us to ask why. Why, why would God do this? Why would God, after like, you know, these people who have been slaves for generations, He's now done this great rescue, why would He intentionally lead them to an obstacle? Well, we'll continue on. The next chapter, actually the very next verse, in Exodus chapter 14, verse 1. Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell the Israelites to turn back and encamp near pi between Migdal and the sea. They are to encamp by the sea, directly opposite Baal Zephon. Pharaoh will think, the Israelites are wandering around the land in confusion, hemmed in by the desert. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them. But I will gain glory for myself through Pharaoh and all his army. And the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. So the Israelites did this. So he's pretty upfront, at least with Moses, about what's going on here. Let me tell you what's going to happen. I'm going to lead you to a dead end where there's going to be this sea right in front of you. There's nothing you're going to be able to do about it. And at the same time, I'm going to, I'm going to start taunting Pharaoh. Hey, buddy, that was real smart. So that was real smooth. 
Yeah, your slave labor's all gone right now. How are you going to make your bricks? That was a pretty dumb idiot move. They probably think that you're a weak leader now. I mean, just ribbing him in some way, right? Uh, you're right. Get the army. And so God's sending the army to attack his people who have reached a dead end. Why? Well, we'll say it this way. His priorities are very different than ours. Very different. Very different. He has a different set of priorities and things that he thinks are important. He tells him exactly why I'm going to do this. I am going to do this so that I will gain glory for myself and that the Egyptians will know I'm the Lord. That's what matters to me. What matters to me, we'll call God a missionary God. It matters more to God that the Egyptians really know that the God of the Israelites is the God of the universe. It is more important to him that they know that than that the Israelites feel safe. It doesn't seem to matter at all to God that the Israelites don't feel safe. It doesn't seem to matter at all to God that they're terrified, that they think that they're going to die. Their safety and their calm in this moment is not his top priority. It would seem that his top priority, what he cares more about, is that the Egyptian people knowing who God really is. And in fact, if we were to continue on through Exodus, Numbers, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, this story lasts forever. And these people keep saying, we knew you guys were coming and we heard the story of what happened in Egypt and we heard the story about the Red Sea and we knew your God was God. We say we have a God and it's kind of this wooden little carved thing that we stick on a shelf with little you know, diamond eyes and little gold ears and we kind of figured out that was just kind of something dumb that my granddad made. But you guys like have like God and stuff, right? That's what God cares about. And if for a moment, if for a season, his people need to be a little bit afraid, if his people feel a little bit abandoned, if his people feel like that there's something bad's going to happen to them, but in the end what matters most to God is that people that do not know him will get to know him. That's what matters to him. And so he's intentionally willing to lead them to a place that they do not want to go, where they'll be overwhelmed with fear and an obstacle that they cannot overcome in order for more people to know Him and for Him to receive glory from that. It doesn't feel right though, does it? Sometimes it just doesn't feel right. I mean, God cares. I mean, we we talk about all the time. He he loves me and and He cares about me. Why would He want me to, to feel anxious? Why would He want to discourage me right in the moment that I'm doing the thing for Him? And I remember I used to feel this. I used to feel this like that God and I had this deal that if I did whatever it is that you asked me to do, that you would take care of all the problems. And that, and that, 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 that okay, we'll just like, I'll obey. If you call me to do something, I'll do it. And you'll, you'll do all the things that only you can do. You'll do all the God things. And I remember the moment that the God things, the things I thought were the God things stopped. I've told this story in a, a few different times. I actually probably told it a hundred times in, my, in the last 17 years. When we moved to Colorado, I was going to seminary, which is preacher school. If you're going to preacher school, if there's ever a time that God's going to bless you, it's when you go to preacher school. I'm like, preacher school, yeah, it's a good thing. You know, you're, you're sacrificing, you're, you're going to be a preacher. It's going to be good. And, and it, was, it was definitely what God wanted. We're following obedience. And every, almost everything that could go wrong went wrong. I mean, and I find myself, and I'm living with my in-laws, delivering pizza, and my car blows up. And in the meantime, I'm taking this summer school class. And it's really angering me. It, we'll just call it, I, I, I used to call it touchy-feely Christianity class. We were going to talk about our emotions. And we were going to start journaling. But I mean, just teach me something already. I don't talk about how I feel about anything. Meanwhile, just seething in anger and somebody needed to help me feel something. I'm just angry. I'm just angry at how my circumstances aren't working out. And now I've got to journal and talk to some people about how I feel about it. And they gave this assignment. You need to go somewhere in isolation with your journal and talk out loud to God. And I'm like, this is the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life. But I'll do it. 
And I'm sitting here on this roadside park on the way from where we lived to where the school was. And I'm sitting there like, I'll do this assignment. And I remember screaming, God, we had a deal. I do what you asked me to do, and you take care of everything. Now, some people get freaked out. Anybody that why I would be yelling, right? People get freaked out, too, when, when people tell audible voice stories with God. I have two, and this is one of them. I'm screaming at God in this roadside park. And in a whisper, I hear, I never made that deal with you. I guess, no, oh, it was, yeah, it's a little bit over 17 years ago. I'm still, I'm still wrestling with it. I mean, I believe something different about it than I did 17 years ago, but I still wrestle with that idea. I still wrestle with this. It just, it's, 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 it's so much what I want. I want my obedience to be met with a smooth path. That's what I want. I don't want God to lead me to the, to, to the sea, to a place that I can't cross with an army behind me. That's not what I want. But God has completely different priorities for me. And as like I said, I've probably told this story a hundred times. And God's done something really cool. He's trying to do something even cooler in me over these last few years through this. And again, if I've told it a hundred times, I would think that at least once, at least once in that time, one other person has heard that and gone, I, I like that. That helps me with where I am. And if so, then in God's priorities, it's been totally worth it. I still think he could have done it the other way. I still wish that he would. But it just seems like he doesn't. And I think that most people kind of know this story, right? We know this story. You know, um, the, God brings up the storm and kind of distracts the, the, the Egyptian army for a little while. And Moses raises his hand and the, and the, and the water comes up and, and the Israelites pass through and then the, the, with the army right on their tail, and as soon as the God's people end up the other side, the, the, the water collapses. And God's people are saved, and the, and the army that was trying to kill God's people is vanquished. Exodus 14, verse 29. But the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. That day the Lord saved Israel from the hands of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians lying dead on the shore. And when the Israelites saw the mighty hand of the Lord displayed against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord and put their trust in him and in Moses, his servant. So this huge obstacle, this sea, they were never going to be able to get through it. They were either going to die drowning or die on the shore from the army behind them. But this obstacle, I'll say it this way, These obstacles that God puts in our life, these obstacles are often God's instrument for salvation. The thing that they thought was going to kill them is ultimately the thing that saved them. We are going to drown in this sea. No, I'm going to save you with this sea. So the thing that they thought that was absolutely going to be completely their undoing was the thing that God used to save them. And so what I would like to suggest is that for some of you here today, the obstacles and the anxiety and the frustration and the circumstances of your life that have gotten so out of hand that led you to finally decide that I'm going to try to see what God has to say about these things. That the reason why he went through those things is so that you could get to this moment and recognize that through those troubles, through his leading you there, that he is offering you salvation. That he's offering you hope and life through Jesus Christ. That you've gone through all of this so that God would work through your circumstances so that you would know that the answer to the hope and the peace and the thing that you're searching for comes exclusively through His Son, Jesus Christ, who came to show us how to live and died on a cross so that the penalty for your sin could be taken from you and that you could live eternally with God forever. That that is why, that's why, And so this thing that just seemed like it was going to be the undoing of me has led you to the point to where you can now finally see the thing that God is wanting to communicate to you. And if that is you, I encourage you right now to say that I'm going to fully give my life to God through His Son, Jesus Christ. 
It makes no more sense for you to say that you're not going to do that then it would make sense for an Israelite to stand on this side of the sea with the water going I was like that looks kind of dangerous all the water walls and things I've never seen anything like that I'm just going to hang out here on the beach and see what happens with me in the chariots it doesn't make any sense God is showing you what he's trying to do and you need to walk down that path And watch the salvation of the Lord come into your life. For those of you who have already experienced that, you may still be feeling or experiencing some obstacle or pain or something that is keeping you. I mean, even the people who are doing this refugee ministry are are having to deal with the fact that an administration is no longer, uh, let's just say, very positive about the idea of refugees being in our country. And so they feel like they've been delayed. It's like, God, why would you rally all of us here? Why would you rally all of us here to to not let us be able to do the thing that we know that you've called us to do? I don't know the obstacle that's in your life. And I don't know enough about the circumstances of your life to know um, the big picture of what God's trying to do. But here's the thing, that we all have access to the one who does. So I would just encourage us, man, as we have some response time, you can pray where you are. You can pray in the back to people that can pray with you. You can pray at the cross. There's prayer candles. You can take communion there. Man, just to talk to God. Like, God, what are you trying to do? What are you trying to show me? What is is it? Because here's the thing I'm trying. I I say, if I were going to be dishonest, I could say, here's the thing I'm convinced of. Here's the thing I think that God is trying to convince me of. That it's time for me to stop praying that he will remove the obstacle from my life. And it's time for me to start praying that that thing that you're going to do through it, God, I just hope it's big and I hope it's awesome. Do that. So that's the prayer that we need to pray as we respond. We also have an opportunity to give. Our ushers are going to come with the buckets. And I, mean, I just encourage you. We talk about going from you are the mission to I help with the mission. This is one of the greatest helps you can do. The money that you give is going all over the world to just about every continent to plant churches all over America and to to reach and help the hurting and broken all over northwest Arkansas. allows us to do the awesome thing that we get to do here with you guys every week. And I just encourage you to um, be faithful with what God has given you to support this, to support our church and, and to multiply this to ministry all around the world. So I just encourage you to respond through giving, through prayer, through reflection. And let's ask God to maybe just kind of open our eyes a little bit about the bigger picture of what he's trying to do in and through us. Let me pray.